I'm here officially because I was speaking at something called Shabbat UK, I don't know if you've heard of this, mm-hmm. in all the United Synagogues, the Shrubberies, etc., and Meat Hill, fabulous one, where my hosts, um, the people came together and were machazing each other by keeping knowing that you're keeping Shabbos. Uh, I could feel, you, you felt, you were joining together with lots of other members of Klal Yisrael to keep Shabbos. So I wanted to ask you a question I asked when I was speaking yesterday. Uh, when you didn't keep Shabbos, why do we keep Shabbos? Shabbat. Why do we keep Shabbos? What is the purpose? Now you'll say that's a ridiculously stupid question. Everybody knows why Jews keep Shabbos. Now, as the Pesach says, that Jews keep Shabbos as an edus, as a testimony, the fact that the Rabbi Shem created the world six days, six nights, and then he stopped and it came to Shabbos. And, and we are uh, living in uh, aiding to that phenomenon, oh, to that to such a thing happened. And everybody says that. There's a fam- you, of course, we all remember the first Rashi and Gracious. And Rashi and said, when it says, Gracious, Borah, the Kim's Shrine, that's all right. Rashi says there, uh, my temp uh, tam pesach of bracious. Why does the Torah begin with bracious? And Meshum Kayach Masav Higad Amoy to teach his people, that's us, what he did and he created the entire world. Let's say Naklas Goyim in order to give them Naklas Goyim. If the non Jewish nations of the world say you're a bunch of thieves, you took the land of Israel from the original inhabitants, you're supposed to turn to bracious and you're supposed to turn around and say, Look at this pasuk here, George, uh, the Rebbeinu Shalom made it. It was his. He gave it to them. They misbehaved. He took it away. Gave it to us. It's his to do with as he likes. So says Rashi. Would you like to use that argument against uh, a, a goy? Would you? Yeah, you would. Would you? <laughs> would, you, would, you would you feel confident about this? Uh, let me tell you a story. I'm not sure if I shared the story with you. Many, many years ago uh, in Glasgow, when I was a teenager. There was an anti-Semitic speaker who was coming to speak in Glasgow, a public meeting. Uh, his name was Michael Adams, and he wrote for a newspaper called The Guardian, which is, you know, the equivalent of uh, the BBC. And, um, and basically, he was an expert in the Middle East, and there was an advert taken in the, the newspaper, the Glasgow Jewish newspaper, it was called The Jewish Echo. I think it was called the Jewish Echo because it mainly echoed the previous week's Jewish Chronicle news. And uh, this advert invite, uh, invited people to come and, uh, and uh, hear this big expert in the Middle East. Next to an exact same copy of, an, of the advert was given by the Jewish Vice Representative Council, what it was called. Same typeface, same size, same. Please don't go. This guy knows his stuff. He's very good. And they just want you to be cannon fodder. So, of course, I went, um, along with some of my friends. I was wearing a, a skip cap. And we were, it was very nasty. They were taking photographs of you, just to intimidate you. Uh, in fact, my friend over there is doing the exact same thing to me at the moment. Um, so, we, keep, so we went in there, and this fellow, he started to talk about, you know, um, the situation with Israel and Palestine. And very soon, Zionists and Israelis where the phrases were dropped, and instead it was the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. And halfway through his talk, he said the following thing. And not only did the Jews commit genocide against the Palestinian people in 1948, uh, they were only copying the behavior of their forefathers, as it says in the Bible, uh, in their Bible, when they took the land of Israel from the original inhabitants, the Canaanites. So, I have to tell you, whenever I speak uh, all around the world, particularly if it's a large audience, you always get, how should I put this politely, an interesting person or two in the audience. Or to be not polite, a lunatic or two. Um, And so I I put up my hand to ask a question, and I used my most nerdish voice. I think I was 17 or something like that. I said, Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams, do you believe the Almighty created the world in six days and six nights? So he looked at the MC who had allowed this question to be asked and said, rolled his eyeballs and he said, no, I don't believe it. He said, but Mr. Adams, it says it in the Bible. So he rolled his eyes again and he said, well, I don't believe what it says in the Bible. <laughs> and then I dropped the silly voice and I said, well, in that case, Mr. Adams, where do you get the information that the Jews committed genocide against the original inhabitants of the land of Israel? 
If you don't believe in the Bible and it's not true, then it never happened. If it is true, then God told him to take the land because it's his to give to whoever he wants. And he did a wonderful, this erudite, famous anti semite a wonderful imitation of a goldfish. There's nothing to say. It was sehr, sehr geschmack. So, so in actual fact, the Rashi here, what he says, that, you know, this is what you're supposed to say to the Ubasa Oilam, if you know how to do it, you can actually use that argument. But the Ramban famously turns around and says, what is Rashi talking about? You all know this Ramban. So that's the first Rashi, the first Ramban. There's an enormous necessity to start the tower with braces. What do you mean we don't need to start the tower with the braces? What's Rashi talking about? Rashi goes on to say, we should have started from Machoish and Zainalchem. We're only interested in mitzvahs. We should start with Shmois. What do you mean we don't need braces? Sorry, Godel. Because if you don't believe, who's Shorish Hamunah? It's the fundamental of what we believe. If you don't believe the Raja created the world, Yeshmi Ayn, who Kaifra Be'ika Be'inlo Tyra Klal. You're an ice bar. You're not part of Klal's role at all if you don't get that rather fundamental idea. So obviously, the reason that rhetorical question I started the year with, what if you were to ask the oil of as I did yesterday, why did Jews keep Shabbos? Because we're Adim. The whole idea of Shabbos is to give aid us to bring us oil. Everybody says that. Rashi says that. So Rashi, that's what Ramban's explaining. The Ramban says that. Even Ezra says, everybody says that. Apart from the Alsha. The Alsha Kodesh asks a Gavaldika question. I give an Alsha Shir every week on, um, on Torah anytime. It's my second year, so I'm looking to try to find Alsha I haven't seen before. And I found one in Pasha's Vyakel, and I thought it was absolutely astonishing. Such a clever question. If it's just, he's not arguing with Rahman Islam with the Rashi Rabban, but if it's just that we get, keep Shabbos in order to give aid to Stabriya Zoilam, then why, if that's the only reason, are you Chayv Misa if you break Shabbos? Who, where do you find in the Torah that anybody is Chayv Misa for not giving aiders. No, you're chayv misa. You can be chayv misa for giving false aiders. Aidim zaymami. But failing to give aiders. Why should you be chayv misa for that? It's an interesting question. I thought it was a very, very good question. So this is what the al Sheikh answers. I think it's a brilliant answer. There's a, there's a phrase um, you're all uh, familiar with, uh, I'm sure, the Latin phrase carpe diem. Uh, in Yiddish translation, chap arayin. There's a moment to chap arayin. And the Torah says that if you don't, if you, if you don't keep Shabbos, then you're chayv misa. Then you're chayv misa. What does it mean, chayv misa? You know, al piyaloch, it's almost impossible ever to give anybody the, the death penalty anyway. You've got to have two aid him, two kosher aid him, and you have to give warnings before the fellow breaks Shabbos. And we're going to be the aid, we'll take the base, and you're going to be killed with this. We'll be the executioners. Who would do it? Oh, but the Asher says, no, but Emmas is something different. We all know, the Gemara says, we find it all through Sefer Chazal, that when it comes to Shabbos, a Jew is given a special, a special thing, a Neshama Yisera. How would you translate the words Neshama Yisera? An extra soul. And I, up until I just saw this, uh, this Alshik a few weeks ago, I translated that for the whole of my life, the exact same way as we all translate it, a Neshama Yisera. But that's problematic. Um, because what is this Nishami Yisera? You know, of course, the name that you're given is the name of your soul. It describes your soul. So I am a Yehuda Yaina Ben Avram. That's the name of my Nishama. So Shabbos, you got an extra one? What's the name of that other Nishama? George? The Alshu says, the Shami says, what does y- Yisera mean? Yoiser means more. When it comes to Shabbos, your neshama expands. The keli, which is your neshama, expands and is able, as a consequence, to be macabre, more kedusha at that particular time. Twice as much kedusha than you could do any other time of the week. So that's the neshama you say that you get. When it means that you're chayv misa, when it says that you, if you break Shabbos, you're going to be, you're going to be, be killed, it means you're going to kill yourself. You've got an opportunity to grow. There comes to Shabbos an opportunity to expand, to fill your keli doubly from what you could do during the week, and you miss that, you're not going to grow. I don't know if anybody here has ever been on a diet. I'm just looking around the room here, obviously, no, no one. Yeah. What happens at. Yeah, <laughs> me, I'm, I'm in one now. So what happens you stand on the scales? 
And then you look, right, you started your diet, you start the skills, you look, and you go, oh, yeah. right. And then you diet for the first week. Next Sunday, I do it on Sunday. You, uh, straight out of the shower, right, look down, no change. Right, next week, right. So that's usually when people give up. But if you keep going, people haven't seen you for six months, go, wait, wait, you've lost a lot of weight. In fact, my daughter said this to me when I arrived here this week. What do you think? Um, uh, so the key answer, change normally happens slowly. Uh, incrementally. That's what the Alshuk says. The bracha we make before we do any mitzvah is asher kiddushanam a mitzvah sab et zavonu, etc., etc. Asher kiddushanam a mitzvah sab. You've made me holy. But you don't see it. You don't feel it. It's like stepping in the scales. It's a tiny, tiny change. You can't see it. But there are some times then you, when the change is <coughs> enormous and huge, Shabbos is done. You can grow enormously. It's a huge leap forward when you, when you em- embrace Shabbos the way it's meant to be embraced. And Robert Nestor famously quotes, and everybody knows it's a very, very famous vort of his in Michtam um, Elio, and page 21 of Chelik Base, when he says, he quotes Ritzvi Hirsch uh, Breide from Kelm, who says, Ki lo hazman over al odom el odom nasir b'seich hazman. It's not that time passes over a man, but the man passes through the time. What's the shant? So if we had a whiteboard here, you know, you remember back in school, in a history book, you open a history book, they always portray time as a line. In fact, it's called the timeline. And then they put, so it's a horizontal line, and vertical little marks through it. 1066. Battle of Hastings, which was fought where? In Hastings, no. Uh, yeah, five miles away in a place called Bakken. Okay, right, and then more Jewishly, 1096. Oh, First Crusade, slaughter of Jews, that's when Rashi lived, right? Move on to a more significant date, 1440, invention of the printing press. Svorin became much more available, that's important. Uh, where I live, 1776. Enormous mistake. They decided to leave us behind and look what they've got. Um, and so, 1914, first of all, 1918, 1933, Hitler came to power. 1939, good, very good. 1945, good. 1948, finally, the state of Israel, 1955. 1955. I was born one of the most. Uh, Significant dates in Jewish history, uh, and then 120 years later, right, and Yisgadav, uh, Yisgadav, and then time passes on. It's usually portrayed as a line, but of course time is circular. As Rabbi Desta famously gives the motion of a spiral staircase. You're watching your Chava going up the spiral staircase, and you're standing looking. So here he is again, and then he goes round, you can't see him, and he goes back again. So you're moving forward, or he's moving forward, you're going forward, but you're going back to the same spot every time. So Pesach is man cheresin. The Rabban Shalom expresses into the Bria a koyach of cheres, a cheres physical cheres, and also spiritual cheres. Um, it's man man toresinu. Rabbi Desla beautifully says, and what's the koyach that comes into the world? For Hanukkah, he says, Azus, chutzpah. Something we dabbed this morning, keep me away from Aziponi, me Azusponi, but it can be used like all meters for something positive as well. For one old Jew to want to take on an empire, that's a chutzpah. But he was successful. When it comes to Shabbos, there's an expression into the world of Kedusha, Kihi Mekor Habrocha, which is unequaled by any other time. And if you have a rhyme, you can grow. Now, see Hishfeber, the first Manchester Rosh Hashiva, I told you this a couple of years ago. He says, mm-hmm. We all know that when it says Vayhi, in fact, we're coming to Megillus, Rus, so Vayhi, something bad's going to happen. Vahoyo, something good's going to happen. Why? So he says, you know that he means will be. But when you put the vav in front of it, it's called the vav hofuch, the vav that turns things around. The will be will, becomes was. Vahoya means was. Put a vav in front of it, it will be. And that's good. Vahoya is good. And by he's bad. Why? It's this brilliant insight, he says, because if Vahoya was was, past tense, with the vav, it becomes good. If your future your will be, is based on your was, it was, then that's good. That's Geshmak. 
if somebody comes along with a new idea for Cloud Israel, a new innovation, then the phrase in English, look before you leap, tells us to, well, look before you leap, but the direction of a Jewish eyes should be behind. Because nobody's got a, more, a longer and more extensive history than us in Kol Chodesh Takas Hashemesh. If you want to come up with that, somebody wants an idea, a change for Cloud Israel, we don't need to do this so much and that. We can just look back. There will be a pattern. We've seen this stuff before. And if a person's life is operated on the Hoyo, that he looks back and it's good, then it's very Gishmak. Very Gishmak. If you say instead, if only I had, if only I had, that's a Vayi. But if you can say, I'm glad I did, that's a Vahoyo. You got it right. You move forward. Do you remember? Again, a number of years ago, I told you a story. Uh, happened here in Manchester. Um, there was a wonderful year to live in Narki here, here. Ramot Chabun and Brandeis. Long show. And he had a, a, a wholesale bag business down Bernie Road. And even in those days, I was traveling around the world saying lots and lots of shit. And as a consequence of that, um, my, I, I wrecked my bags uh, and my suitcases very frequently, or to be more accurate, the baggage handlers wreck my bags and suitcases very frequently. And so I needed to get a new one. So I went down, and Moscow Bindam wasn't there, but there was a non Jewish guy with a flat cap, talked with a Manchester accent like that. And I said, Is Moscow Bindam here? No, what are you looking for? So I thought I was looking for. He said, Right, go down to the end of that row there, turn left, a little bit further down, you'll find the bag you want. I said, fine. And down I went, and I found the bag, and he shouts it. Remember him shouting from the office, well, if you find it, bring it in, and I'll write you a receipt. And so I brought the bag in, and I sat down, and he's writing the receipt. He said, you think you've come here to buy a bag, don't you? And I said, yes. He said, no, you've come here to tell me a Devar Torah. <laughs> now, I have to tell you uh, that sometimes, particularly non-Jewish folk who work with Yidin, pick up phrases. Where I live in, in what's called the Five Towns in New York, there's a Chinese restaurant. I don't know what your feelings are about Chinese food, but I'm a bit addicted. Um, and you go in there, the little Chinese lady in charge of it, uh, as you're going out, says, Don't forget to come to Oma. <laughs> last night was... She doesn't even tell you what today is. She tells what last night is. So more non-Jewish folk, you know, they, they pick up unser Sprach. They say, I want a Dvar Torah. And I looked at me, and I don't want just any Dvar Torah. I want an Alshech. <laughs> at this point, I realized that this was not, this was not a non-Jewish guy after all. So um, I've always got an Alshech up my sleeve. And so I told him an Alshech. Ah, he said, ah. He said, oh. Our old Rebbe, he knew who I was. Rabbi Yonah Balkan, he was an old Balkan boy like I am. For those of you who don't know, Rabbi Balkan was uh, one of the great Mechanikim of Manchester. Yeah, yeah. And probably, probably a Gilgal of the Alshuk, I would guess. <laughs> uh, he certainly knew the Alshuk inside out. In fact, I asked Rabbi Yaakov Hill, who was also a Balkan boy, one of the Kadani Adar, and, you know, a Makubal. Uh, he was giving me a scholar for one of my books. Sorry, that just slipped out. And, um, and I said to him, you know, uh, do you think Rabbi Yonah was... Uh, was a Gilgal of the, of the Alshach? He said, I haven't a clue, because he's a very down-to-earth Makub. Anyway, soft called soft. He was an old Balkan boy, this fellow. He said, you know, Rebbe Balkan gave me a piece of advice, advice, whatever it was, 40 years before. He's an older fellow. I didn't listen to it. He was learning in Manchester Yeshiva. In those days, there was a, an annual conscription, a year's conscription to the British Army. Uh, you had to go and, and do, your, do your duty for a year. <coughs> and uh, but if you were learning in, if you were, if you were studying to be a minister of religion, so you should be studying to be a rabbi, you had a patur, you didn't have to go. Um, and Rabbi Balk had said, you know, you don't have to go. But he felt he had to, he wanted to do his patriotic duty for queen and country, and so he went. And he thought he would come out, you know, and take up from where he left off. So by the time he left the British Army after a year, he had no, he'd know it to be not every bit of Yiddish guy out of him. He had nothing left. He said, I married the wrong woman. Listen to as our lotion. I married the wrong woman. I've had no nachas from any of my children. 
I regret not listening to his advice every single day of my life. That's if I eat. If you're looking, I could do it. See, I'll be okay. I'll look at the face. Instead of looking to the past, if your sprach is, if only I had, then life is a vayi. But if it's a vahoyo, so I can't, I don't think I've told you this story. Um, one of the great enjoyments of being in York, at this particular tekufa, is that there is a whole chelik, a whole shevet of Klal Yisrael, who moved to New York about 40 years ago. They're called Bacharians. And they came from around about Tashkent, that area of Asian, what was then the USSR, Sephardi Jews. Um, but the Russians, the communists, had really done, uh, they were quite pretty posh to begin with, but the Russians bleached any remnant of Yiddishkeit out of them. And then they all somehow or other got out after the Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, they came to New York with mamish penniless, mamish garnished, garnished Yiddishkeit, garnished Gashmias, or Ruchnias. And today they're building Beis Yaakov schools. I teach them one of them. Uh, and seminaries and yeshivas, and uh, they're, they're doing great stuff. And it's wonderful to be a part of this. And uh, this was back about, I think, three, four years ago. I got a phone call from an organization called Kazakh, a very good organization who's working with Bacharian Jews. Um, because they told me they had got 200 young teenagers, Bacharian teenagers, to come and spend a Shabbos. Well, they went away, it's like it's a hotel or something, and, they, and the, the deal was, if you come away from Shabbos and you keep Shabbos, just one Shabbos, they get $200 each. So they've done that. So they wanted me to come and give them a, a drosha uh, to try and keep the momentum going. So I drove across, and I arrived. They were going to be getting Chinese food. And maybe this is a terrible loss of horror, but whole kihila, but as you probably know, there are certain types of Yidin who are very, very macbid when it comes to time. Yekis, for example. You all have heard about the Yeku who was late for Mincha. He missed Ashri, but wasn't time for Yoshvi. Um, so, so <coughs> Yekis are always pumplach on time. Hasidim, not so much. I have a cousin who is a Belzer through marriage, and uh, he tells me, just because Abelza puts in his daughter's wedding invitation, Chuppa starts properly at 7 o'clock, doesn't actually mean that it necessarily has to start at 9 o'clock. So, I mean, like I said, we're a little bit more relaxed at the time, so are Bacharians, so I arrived there, but I'm being British, I arrived when I was told to be there at 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock. And I stood, the food hadn't arrived, I'm standing there for two hours. Um, and eventually in comes the rabbi, uh, who was the organizing, he said, oh, he said, I have you been waiting long? No, of course, we are British, and therefore we never say what we're thinking. No problem, I said, translation, I've been waiting here for two hours. Um, and then he said, would you mind if somebody speaks before you? <laughs> uh, the real version, of course I would. Are you off your head? The British answer, not at all. Um, and so there was a young lady, and this young lady was called Rose, and she was to speak. So I just sat down there, and she stood there, and she said that uh, you've all just kept your first Shabbos. This is my tenth Shabbos. She's kept ten Shabbos, and they're like, ah, they're all applauding. For and she told them the story. She said, I kept, uh, this is my tenth Shabbos, and I have to tell you, I'll be honest with you, I found keeping Shabbos very, very difficult. And of course, as you probably know, for non-religious Jewish people, Saturday is when they do stuff. They go to football matches, or they play basketball, or ice skating, or shopping. Well, it's a busy time. And to not be busy, is, it's very difficult. She found Shabbos very difficult. And particularly because she was staying at home, not too far from where I live in Long Island in New York, uh, with her family who are not from. Um, and so the TV's on, and they're answering the phone, and the cars are pulling up, and the people are going out. So she said to her family, look, I'm finding this difficult. You've got to help me keep Shabbos. I want you to play games with me and Shabbos afternoon. I want an hour of your time to play Vice Monopoly, something like that. Because you found that a bit difficult. There must be very special people because they decided to give two hours of their time Shabbos afternoon to help her keep Shabbos. Sure. Her father's ambition for this young lady was that she should qualify as a dentist. Why a dentist? I don't know, but it's a good pronosa. He always had an idea that his daughter that would be very, give her security for the future. In fact, 
They enrolled her in a university in Queens where she could do a foundation year in dentistry, one year foundation year. But the best dental school in America is Columbia Dental. And to get even an interview, that's like a madriga. Uh, they only take, if I remember rightly, I think it's 30, maybe 60, it's a very small number of students every year. And she got an interview. So she goes along to the interview, and the fellow in charge of the, of the, of the dental school, probably somebody Jewish, is interviewing her, and he said, I have to tell you, Rose, I'm very impressed with your dedication. I'm very impressed with your ambition in dentistry and the fact you've already done a foundation year. I can't give you a definitive answer now, but I think I can assure you, you see, every tomorrow morning, I give every week at 10 o'clock a lecture in the main lecture theater. I think I can assure you that if I see your face tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in my lecture, you have a place in our school. This was her parents' dream come true. And a smile broke out in her face. And then she realized that 10 o'clock the next morning, the shows. So she said to the fellow, I'm very sorry, but I'm, I've, I've started to become Torah observant. I've become a religious Jew, and it's our Sabbath tomorrow. And the professor in charge of the school, I'll say probably Jewish, said the exact same words. I'd just like to tell you that if I see your face in my lecture tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, you have a place in the school. So she drove home and she comes in and the family are waiting and she told him, her father the story, she's got a place, all she has to do is go to lecture and he jumps up, a pants and a spring, and he's jumping up, ah, oh, is his dream come true for his daughter? She said, Dad, I don't think I can go. He said, what do you mean you don't think you can go? It's Shabbat, Dad. Honey, talk to God. Explain to him that it's your career. I'm sure God will understand, right? I mean, this is your whole future here. Just tell him. I mean, I'm sure it'll be okay. Dad, I don't think that's how this works. Look, sweetheart, your mom and I set aside $10,000 for the deposit. If you didn't get to this school, for to process your application to the next best school, We'll give you this $10,000, and you can give it to whatever to charity, ever Jewish charity you want, the doctor you want. But please go to the lecture. Now, for Shtetsuch, uh, the Yitzhar is doing a number, as they say in America, on her. It's, it, what do you know? Book a t- what, maybe you can get into a taxi. Maybe book an Uber. Arrange for it to come. If it's 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock, you get in there, and uh, you'll pay it say, if it's, uh, automatically on after Shabbos, and uh, you're not sitting in the lecture, you don't have to take notes. What do you know? And the father's standing there almost in tears. Dad, I don't think I could do it. And so the father pulled out his trump card. You know which one? The one we've all used. Honey, if you're not going to do it for me, it's not for you. Do it for me. Right. She didn't do it. The next morning, uh, when it comes to Sunday, she's breaking her heart. She phoned up the rabbits and had helped her in her journey to be Macabal Torah Mitzvahs, to the point where she was now up to keeping 10 Shabbos. And she's crying her eyes out. I was stupid. I've thrown away all my career. My parents are broken hearted. And I didn't even know I should have phoned you. Maybe I could have gotten attacked. And the rabbits had said to her, look, this is a, no doubt a big sign. It's a big test. The Rabbanish have given you a big test. But we've talked about these things. Hashem sends people tests in life. And you've been given a big test. I'm not minimizing the fact you were given a big test. But you passed the test. Don't regret the fact that you passed the test. And all the way through the telephone conversation, somebody's been trying to break in, somebody's been trying to get through, and it's just driving her nuts. She says, she says to the rabbits, and I'll just take this call because I'll phone you straight back. And she switched calls, and a voice said the following thing. This is a test. Test, test, test. So John's University Security Office this is a test. Test, test, test. And it kept repeating it over and over and over again. See, when you when you go to university, they got all their cell numbers, all their mobile numbers. And because America is a crazy place, occasionally people come with guns onto the campus. So they, all their phones get messages, as security, right? It's like a test. You run away, there's a, an act of shooter is the lotion um, or something like that. Don't come. This was just a test. The representative was just saying to her, what? It's a test. Hashem sent you a test, but don't regret not passing the test. She takes the call, what does it say? This is a test. 
test, test, test. So, oh, people normally want to know, did she get into dental school? <laughs> the Emma says she doesn't need, I don't need to tell you that part of the story, but Emma said I didn't know that part of the story because she realized it was an assignment and she passed the test. But I have to tell you, I was saying this year on a Zoom class about six months ago to young ladies who had become recently from, and I told them this story. And when I told them this story, uh, I, I said, I don't know if she, if she got in. And like one of the girls shouted on the, on the parade, she's here, Rose is here. And suddenly there she was. Rose, did you get in? She got in. Right. Because it's about how you, if it is you use the past to calculate the future, then that's Gavaldic. If, if, you, if it's the other way about, then it's a disaster. So the emiss is, why did Jews keep Shabbos? Of course, as an enist, the fact that Hashem Yisbara created the world. But when it comes to Shabbos, it's an opportunity. Because time is circular. Every week we come to a time when our neshama becomes Yisera, becomes bigger, and is able to makabal much more brocha. And that's what I told people for Shabbat, okay? And I think it applies to you and me as well. Uh,